Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Alan Jarrett. I'm a developer at Microsoft. I'm maintainer on eBPF for Windows as well as the UBPF user mode BPF runtime. And BPF Conformance is a project that grew out of some work that Dave Thaler and I have been working on. Uh, the goal here really is to be able to measure whether or not a particular BPF runtime operates in conformance with the ITF BPF spec. So, quick overview. Uh, so, the plan here is to overview what uh, the BPF conformance suite is and answer corrupted questions like, why are we testing this? What has been tested? How has been tested? Who is using it? And what we really should be testing that we're not testing yet. So really, what, what do we mean by conformance in this case? Uh, it essentially is the behavior of the runtime in response to various instructions that are specified in the spec. It's really the question of, does the runtime perform correctly with respect to what the ISO says it should do for that instruction? Uh, this is important because without it, you know, programmers won't do what developers expect them to do. Likewise, there's, there's even also a safety aspect to this. If the verifier and the runtime disagree on what the behavior of the VPF program is, then the verifier may claim the program is safe, when in actual fact, the runtime then fails. Uh, additionally, it just helps developers build confidence that programs they build are portable across different runtimes. And one of the last of aspects is kind of interesting is the BPF I suspect was written after the Linux, the, Linux, this, the, the Linux implementation. And as such, the Linux implementation is essentially is or was at some point authoritative. So we want to ensure that the I suspect that we wrote, the I suspect we wrote actually matches what Linux does. Uh, so essentially what the tests do is they check a specific runtime's implementation of specific instructions. Uh, and the goal is to test if all the instructions in a particular performance group are implemented and that they work as expected. In addition, the tests also include tests for common implementation errors that we've seen across multiple runtimes, including things like incorrect sign extension, failure to truncate, things like that. Most of the test collateral being used is derived from the UBPF self-tests. And there's actually an issue which I'll get to later in the slides. Uh, it is actually slowly being extended and expanded as new test cases are uncovered and new new gaps, we, as we discover new gaps in the existing test coverage. So for, for each of our tests, it essentially is broken down to three parts. The first is a set of declared clean variants. These are the expected state of the runtime before operating the set of instructions. This includes initial register state, initial stack contents, initial memory contents. Then obviously the block of code that needs to be executed. And then the last part is a set of post invariants. Currently we only really check R0 against the return value for it. But the goal is uh, longer term to have more extensive post invariants so that it makes it easier for people writing the tests to be able to validate particular ISA uh, instructions. So the project is currently hosted within my uh, personal GitHub repo. Plan there is eventually to move it to the Linux Foundation, sorry, the eBPF Foundation. Uh, it is being used by the eBPF project, which I'm a maintainer on, as well as the eBPF Windows project. In addition, it is being used by Prevail, the verifier, where Prevail actually uses it to validate its internal model of the BPF instructions, which it uses to, base to co compute its own safety conclusions. And lastly, uh, as a sort of proof of portability, we actually we brought in the RBPF runtime and are actually able to fairly easily validate it. So one of the things we do is we essentially maintain, we establish a baseline of what tests work. In fact, you know, all the tests are executed against the Linux kernel. And the goal there is to determine, you know, is if something fails, is it a test bug? which is the most common case. Sometimes it's something the, where the BPF ISA wasn't correctly specified. Not happening anymore. I think we've got all this sorted out. And the last possibility is it could be a Linux kernel bug. I haven't found it yet, but 
possibly exists. One of the sort of interesting things that this does is it provides us the ability to perform black box observations of the next kernel behavior. This is necessary for us because both the UBPF as well as the UBPF Windows projects and Prevail have licenses that are not compatible with the GPL. So we are restricted from looking at Linux kernel sources. But by following this pattern of conformance testing, we have the way to understand what the, what the Linux kernel is doing without actually inspecting the code. Here is sort of a, one of the examples of the tests. This one I think was, yep, this one is the Indian NIST tests, one of the Indian NIST tests. It essentially consists of the initial memory state, the results we expect to get back, and a small set of BPF instructions. The majority of the tests are actually this small. They are very much targeted to a specific opcode or a specific instructions. So this is where the original subject presentation was about. What is it we should be check? What should we really be check testing for? Is does it make sense to even test for invalid instruction sequences? Currently, the BPF conformance tests are positive tests only. One of the concerns with that is that if we do start adding negative tests, what does it mean that if a runtime fails the negative test, does it necessarily mean that it's not conformant? Or is it merely that some, for instance, a negative test which tests for an unsupported opcode may be a vendor extension on that platform? So that's why we're a little bit uncertain whether or not it makes sense to test for, for add negative tests. In addition, there are certain assumptions about the PSABI, like for instance, on Linux and UBPF Windows and UBPF, R10 is the stack register, but nothing within the BPF ISO actually specifies that. Uh, lastly, the others, are, as I alluded to before, we only really currently look at the R0 exit code. Uh, is this really sufficient? Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, my suspicion is it may make it easier to test if we look at additional uh, post invariants, but R0 is picked simply because that's something we can easily get back from BPF prog test run syscall because it returns the return code from the BPF program. So that's one way we can easily execute them against the Linux kernel and understand what the post invariants were. And lastly, does it even make sense to add tests for help functions? If so, which platforms? Uh, would it be some common subset or would that be an entirely different set of tests? So one of the big challenges we're facing is how do we make sure that we get good coverage of the BPF ISO spec? Uh, while fuzzing the UBPF runtime, we, we found out that there were definitely test gaps in the BPF conformance tests. Uh, this showed up as BPF programs that were safe, but returned different values post invariance when running JIP versus interpret mode. This is useful, but it has a limited utility simply because the BPF programs that the fuzzer generates can be hard to understand, sometimes challenging to understand, okay, why did we have to step through to understand, okay, why is this post invariant what we're getting? Uh, additionally, we could do it through just manually reviewing the BPF ISA specification, but that tends to be time consuming, tends to be error prone, simply that it relies on the person reading it to interpret it correctly and then implement the test correctly. Uh, lastly, and this would be the preferred approach, is if there was some machine readable model of the BPF ISO specification that we could then iterate over and generate a, a full closed set of possible tests from that. So, open questions for the audience. Uh, is this the best way to achieve this goal? Also, is it possible, or does it make sense to perhaps check not just the verifier and the runtimes that understand the BPF ISA, but also the compiled version of it? Uh, and lastly, some small sort of uh, admin fixes that ideally I will move this off of my own repo to BPF Foundations repo, simply to ensure continuity and things like that. Uh, that's been approved by the BPF Foundation, but it's very hard to achieve legal issues. So, at this point, I'm going to throw it open to the audience. Are there any questions?
Hey, Alan, this is Dave. Uh, can you go back to the slide? I forget what it was titled. It was the one that was before generating a new test. That one. Um, yeah, the what should the conformance test measure? So just um, uh, my opinions on this one. Um, because I think you've done a good job of using it to validate the ISA spec itself by uh, saying, let's run the test against the Linux kernel, and if they fail, it means that the ISA spec is wrong. Um, and so that's been very useful uh, because that we've actually found things that's been fixed in the ISA spec. Um, when we look at the other specs that um, the IETF will be doing in the future that haven't been written yet, um, I think it would be great if we could do something similar for those, right? And so if there's a separate set of conformance tests for each spec, right, that lets us lock the ISA and you say, well, here's the ISA conformance tests. And then, uh, you know, the, the, if there's a PSAPI document to the extent that we can write any conformance tests to test that, then we can use that same approach that says, is the API document, you know, uh, well specified, right? Is it precise and, and doesn't have errors and things? And so I would love to see that. I think it's different, maybe different groups of tests, right? One for each document that's actually testable. And I don't know how many of them are testable, um, but uh, at least two, maybe more. Um, and that would be very useful to, to say there's groups of tests. And so um, that's why I, I like the name of this is maybe BPF conformance tests and not ISA conformance tests, right? Because I can imagine a different set of tests for each document, right? Um, lastly, um, uh, on the currently only R10 is measured on exit, on exit is this sufficient? Um, right now, from what I've looked at on the tests, yes, it's sufficient because anything else you can write code to do with and set R0 appropriately. Um, and so it's a decent workaround, and so I think other things would be higher priority than uh, measuring anything other than R0 because you can deal with that just in terms of how you write the test. On the, on the last one, test for helper functions, um, right now on the list of uh, IETF documents, there is one that says cross-platform helper functions. And so I can imagine um, when that document comes around, and there may be tests that could go into the suite for that one. And so that gets into my same comment about the test for PSABI. And the answer is whatever appears in the document would be useful to um, have tests for um, so that we know that the document is right. So this is me as a uh, document person. So. So it's the one more question that I didn't hear you answer there is, what is your opinion on checking for another instruction sequences? My only worry there is, if a vendor you have to extend the ISA or have an extension that matches what we consider the valid instruction sequence, should we fail the process? Or uh, is, it, is it maybe the case that the only way they're allowed to, they have to pre-register their extensions? Or what is, the, what is the thinking there in terms of ensuring that uh, do we test for invalid instruction sequence? Do we not? Should we? Should we? Yeah. I think it's a good question, and it's a good question that Alan and I have discussed before, and so I'll give my opinion now, but I'm really interested in if anybody else in the audience has something on this one. Um, but um, my opinion is the ISA spec itself doesn't say what to do with the undefined, you know, opcodes and undefined, you know, spaces, right? And so it's the behavior is undefined. So can you write a test for behavior that's undefined, right? Because if you say you must you know, fail and you must do something, then the spec should have said that. And so right now, I think the answer is uh, no, don't, because I don't know what it would do. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, but that's what I was thinking, my yeah. intuition. If somebody has a bright idea as to what you could do, I'm all ears, so. I mean, like, from yeah. from, a, from a kernel perspective, right, if, if something would pass, uh, or like, would, yeah would pass, then we would have a problem in the future on using that, right? So that would be a problem. So we want to have it rejected. But yeah, I agree with you on, on yeah. the yeah. ISA specification. Yeah. But, but I get Alan's um, goal that says, OK, how do we know that using this opcode won't break because somebody's random you know, offload card or whatever is using it for something? And if we say, oh, well, I passed this confirmance test, then I know that it's usable because they're not squatting on the space or something like that. I just don't know any way to do that. So. This actually uh, came up while supposing UPPF runtime. Uh, in there was a there was a bug in UPPF runtime where, in one particular case, we were looking at uh, the value of the immediate field to assume what the type of instruction was, and not checking the actual flag in the opcode, which would have been an invalid instruction sequence. But for the case of well-formed instructions, it works correct. Uh, and then the only way to find this was through hitting it with the valid instructions and saying, hey, the JIT operates one way, the uh, runtime interpreter operates a different way. So my concern there is, yeah, uh, 
there's there may be bugs where it accepts things it shouldn't accept. So. Yeah, I, I think the probably the most common case where that's likely to happen is there are multiple uh, runtimes out there, as you mentioned, you know, RBPF and you know offload cards and stuff. Is the case where you have multiple instructions per off code, per per op code, okay? Because if they've implemented it such that the op code does something and they never look at you know offset or SRC, you know the source value or something like that, and they just implement it, then they're doing the wrong thing because. The ISA has now constrained that, right? That was, I think Jose mentioned this in his presentation, where like the legacy packet instructions, we narrowed to just what was in use and so on, so we wouldn't squat on the space. But how do you know if somebody's implemented that whole op code in their offload card? Uh, and so I would love to be able to test to says, okay, they're, they're, they're actually doing that. I mean, they're, they're, they're not using that space, right? They really are narrowing it to, to, to what's actually defined in the ISA spec. Um, and so I would love to hear a way to do that, but I can't think of one right now. If you have if folks have any suggestions here, you know, feel free to reach out to me today. Uh, love to hear them. One of the other points that I think is kind of an interesting challenge is how do we generate a complete set of tests? How do we know that? I mean, we can look at the list of instructions being covered and the lock codes being covered, but even within a single lock code, there could very well be edge cases where the, that would make sense to be tested, but not currently tested. Case in point is there was a, uh, a set of bugs in one of the UVPF cases where we were failing to truncate after a physical operation. Uh, I mean, we were missing one test for that. And while the ISA definitely specifies that, it's sometimes hard to figure out what all tests you need to generate from a spec. So I'm not sure if anybody has had experience with you know, producing conformance tests from things like, for instance, Java bytecode or any other pseudo instruction sets like that. What is the sort of best way of doing this? What is the state of art for generating tests from a specification? Uh, there was a talk back in I think 2020 on on sort of similar topic. It's presented in the plumbers called eliminating bugs in BPF JITs using automated form of verification. So it's not fuzzing in that sense, but the 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 goal is the same, trying to find the, the difference. Um, they're using it. They're what they did was finding the difference between the BPF JIT and the interpreter. So I think it's sort of similar. That might be something that's worth looking into. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I, I was just going to add that I like your bottom bullet there. If somebody wants to you know, work on that, if there's like a grad student or whatever that wants to do the machine readable model of the BPF ISA, I can imagine you could use that to generate test cases. Uh, to see if the, either to verify that the machine readable model is you know correct or that the implementation is um, that sounds like a promising approach. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think my time is just about up. So, if folks have any other questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Yeah. Unless there's some more questions. Cool. Any last questions? No? Well, then, thank you very much. <laughs>